My name is Sarah Melvie Klein, and I'm the Addictions Administrator at Coordinated Care and co-chair of the Access to Treatment Committee. I'm so happy to be here in person with you all today. Thank you so much for coming to the 2023 Opioid Summit. I'd like to remind everyone to please go ahead and silence your cell phones to be fully present with us during this time. And also a reminder that this meeting is being recorded and live streamed. A little bit of background on the Tacoma Pierce County Opioid Task Force who put this event together. We're a joint effort between Pierce County, the City of Tacoma, the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department, and Elevate Health, as well as a regional response to the opioid crisis. The task force promotes positive behavioral health and well-being and works to reduce substance use related stigma. The task force's committees focus on access to treatment, prevention and education, integration of medication for opioid use disorder, transportation, and fighting stigma. We've been holding this annual opioid summit since 2018 to bring the community together for a call to action. The theme for this year's summit is creating a system and culture of care in our community. Some goals and outcomes that we hope that you'll experience today are encouraging and leading by example to treat community members with compassion, defining what a community of care is and co-developing that definition with the other people here today, showcasing that all of us need to be connected in order to help the individual, promoting low barrier, person-centered care, and discussing how we can have conversations with others, including medical professionals, about using this approach. Fostering interdependency through building connections rooted in equality and inclusivity to care for our community members impacted by the opioid crisis. And we really hope that today's discussions and activities demonstrate that we are stronger together. At this point, I'd like to please welcome David Turnipseed, David is a member of the Puyallup tribe. He's worked for the tribe since 2018 and is currently a language teacher for the Puyallup tribal language program. The language program's mission is the revitalization of the Lushitseed language in the Puyallup tribal community and beyond. The number of speakers is growing through online classes, social media, community events, language nesting in the home, and multi-generational involvement. More visibility and awareness is creating a healthy environment for Lushitseed to grow and flourish and for the Puyallup tribe to be seen and represented. You can learn more at the website PuyallupTribalLanguage.org. Good day to you all, honorable people. All right, I'm going to read this uh, land acknowledgement for you all, and I thank you so much for uh, having me here. It is the land right here that the Puyallup people have lived on since the beginning of time. This right here is where we are in this world, our homelands. We work on our ancestral lands. We raise our children who go to school on the land of the Puyallup tribe. O Hegwudchas, Tis Shwananam Tliti, O Khal Shitab, Ti Pas Pastad, O Kwade Dup. We acknowledge that the Medicine Creek Treaty was signed for the benefit of Caucasian settlers. O khal shitab chas atis shwananam tliti atiswat huftad chas. O tsutav tis pas pastad squal of swat huftad lap. Toch albaquad shitab atis pas pastad atis swat huftad chas. Land was assigned to our people. Caucasians said, This is your land. But the Caucasians took that land from us too. 
O kada ditab chat, the tiswad hum ted chat, O zak atub teed tleeti. Our land was stolen from us, treaties were broken. To didis chas a altis lachel. But we are still here today. U kwi kwi chatet, u kwili chatet, u ij chatet, u ala los chatet. Our people forage for food and materials. We pick berries, we canoe, we practice our traditional ways, and we speak Twol Shootseed. Just as our ancestors did. I'm finished. Heshba, he's quote. Thank you, David. I would now like to introduce the executive sponsors of the Tacoma Pierce County Opioid Task Force. Dr. Anthony Chen, Director of the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department, Council Member John Hines with Pierce County Council, and Council Member Janie Hitchin with the Tacoma City Council. Thank you, Sarah. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, what a wonderful day, and what, what a beautiful space, isn't it? Um, we're so grateful to be here in this space and also on the land that, um, as we heard, um, that we acknowledge. So this is the first time in three years um, that we're bringing together those who are dedicated to ending the opioid crisis in Tacoma and Pierce County. So thank you, everyone, who, has come, who have come, and thank you for those of you who are watching uh, remotely. Uh, and we come to motivate each other, discuss strategies, and move to action. COVID-19 um, brought with an unexpected shift in the way we work and engage with others. We learned new ways to provide services to our communities. We also engaged even more people through online meetings and online service delivery. Even through the pandemic, we worked upstream to move from tertiary to primary prevention we focused on wellness and the continuum of care. We cared for the people in our communities and we provided access to resources and services that people need. People are suffering from much distress and need programs and services to support themselves and their families. And we are looking forward to, um, as you'll hear later as part of the program, what we might be able to do um, with the opioid settlement funds that will give us uh, much needed resources to tackle this huge problem. More than ever, we need a path forward. We need a comprehensive and coordinated system with everyone working together. Each of us knows how the opioid epidemic affects our community. Many of us see it every day at work. Others of us live through the tragedy much closer to home. And everyone has a role to play to end the opioid crisis. Over the last five years, we have seen the challenges and have adjusted our work each time we needed in order to bring more stakeholders to the table. Your voice is critical. Today, you will help share our future work. And thank you to every one of you for taking the time to be here. Together, we can end the opioid epidemic in Pierce County. And with that, Council Member Hitch. Thank you, Dr. Chen, and thank you, Sarah, for kicking us off and for the wonderful um, land acknowledgement. I'm Janie Hitchin. I'm on the Pierce County Council, and I represent District 6. Um, I'm also the vice chair of the health department this year. Um, I want to start by thanking you for taking some time to come and spend the morning and part of the afternoon to talk about how we can actually tackle, it, tackle the opioid epidemic that is harming and killing people in our community. We have some funding coming into our community now through a lawsuit. It's sad that that's the way we had to go, but it's here. And we're gonna talk about the wonderful things that we have the opportunity to do to better support the children, the adults, and the whole community um, on how we can actually make some impactful differences in that work today. So for taking the time, whether you're watching online 
or watching it later because you're recording, watching the recording, or you're here present today, thank you for taking the time to do that and prioritizing this work. I do want to pause and thank the electeds that are in the room. Um, as a new elected, I don't know how long I kept to keep using that, but I'm gonna. Um, I know this is important to make sure our schedules are extremely busy, as many of yours are, but I want to make sure that we acknowledge they're here um, and thank them. So I'm gonna start with the chair of the health board, uh, Board of Health for Tacoma Pierce County. So I'm Catherine Ushka, who's also on the Tacoma City Council. And we also have in the room um, Councilmember John Hines from Tacoma, who's going to be here for a moment to speak. Um, my colleagues on the Pierce County Council, we have Vice Chair Marty Campbell with us. And Councilmember Paul Herrera is with us. And then we have from the City of Fife, Councilmember Fundungas. I probably said it wrong. I'll get it better. And Councilmember um, uh, um, Daryl Eldinger from Edgewood is, yes, maybe. And then I had a couple others, but I didn't see them come in. So if you were an elected and I missed you, could you please stand and thank, thank you so much for being here? And I know we have some that are coming later, but again, for everybody that's here, thank you for taking the time um, to pause and do this really important work with us. Thank you. Councilmember Hines. <clears throat> okay. Well, no, again, when you go last, uh, everybody usually says a lot of things you already wanted to say. So thank you again for all being here. Um, you know, I just want to take a moment. I'm John Hines. I'm a Tacoma City Council member. Um, and I've been part of the opioid task force since I took the spot of uh, Councilmember McCarthy a few years ago. I just want to take a moment to talk about why I am here and what I, why I want to be part of this group. So the opioid crisis is, is a national one that plays out locally. And despite of all the heroic efforts of the people in this room and the people in this community, we still know there are gaps in the infrastructure and services out there for the people in our community. If we don't work together right now and in the future together, if we don't act locally, our residents and our service providers, our first responders, our friends, our neighbors, and if you're like me, our family members, are the ones who are gonna pay the highest cost of this epidemic. I think as I'm part of this, and I think about as, as a member of the Tacoma City Council, what we really wanna see, and I like to call it the three rights. Right place, right time, right service. So right place means that we're putting our investments in places where parts of our community have played an undue burden a huge toll of the opioid crisis has been, has been placed upon certain of our communities. We want to make sure that we're providing the services in those communities. We also want to make sure that no matter where you are, because the opioid epidemic doesn't respect county boundaries or city boundaries. It's in every community. So if you're in Edgewood, you shouldn't have to go to Eatonville to get the services you need. You should have those services provided to you in your community. When I think about right time, Whenever our resident raises their hand and says, I need help, we need to be there to help them. We have multiple systems that operate in our community, whether it's the criminal justice system, whether it's the school system, whether it's the healthcare system. We wanna make sure that when residents who are dealing with substance use disorder want help, no matter where they are, they can get it. And then I think the right service is the most important one. How are we making sure we're meeting the needs of the residents in our community that need the help in a way that's destigmatizing that's culturally relevant and responsive, that meets their needs. Because in the end, we want to make sure that people who need help can get it when they need it where they are. I'd like to close just real fast by saying a quote that our mayor, Victoria Woodards, often says. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And I recognize that we have many people in our community that want us to go fast that want us to respond quickly, that when you say wait, they hear never. But at the same time, I believe we're at a very important opportunity for us as a group and as a community to think broadly about how we not only address the current needs we have in our community, but set our community up for success for generations to come. Because I would love it if we were the last group 
that had to talk about how we address the opioid epidemic in our community. So I'm excited to be here today. I'm excited to be here with all of you. Thank you for taking the time to be here. And I look forward to working together with all of you in the months and years ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. We now have a video from the mayor of Tacoma, Victoria Woodards, that we would like to share. I'm Mayor Victoria Woodards, and I'm so sorry that I couldn't join you today for the Opioid Summit. As I think about this day, and I think back about five years ago, when this was just forming in Tacoma, I remember having a deep conversation with then council member Connor McCarthy. And we talked about the fact that we were losing too many lives to opioids in our community, and we weren't having enough real dialogue about how to solve it. Um, lucky for us, about the same time the National League of Cities came out with an RFP looking for five cities to be a part of, an op of a national opioid cohort. Tacoma was selected as one of five cities. We were the only city west of the Mississippi who got to join this cohort. And through this cohort, we got to work with five other cities in the United States to figure out how they were facing the challenges um, and the impacts that opioids were having in their community. We quickly brought that knowledge back to Tacoma, and I'm so grateful that then former council member Derek Young and our current um, executive director, Anthony Chen, all got together and said, we really want to address this in Pierce County. How can we take what we're learning at the national level and apply it on the local level? Hence, the Opioid Task Force was born. And since that Opioid Task Force has come together, we've implemented several programs across our community in which we are saving lives. When I think of just here in Tacoma, um, Connor really pushed, or Council Member McCarthy really pushed to make sure that we had an opioid unit at our substation so that anytime somebody walked into a fire department, they could get immediate help. And we called those safe stations. They are now funded in our budget and we continue to fund that operation here in Tacoma. And that's just one of the many examples we have out of what came from that opioid, um, being a part of that opioid task force. Um, and then when we think about the local task force here who has done all the great work in our city and brought us to this mark, what I want to say to all of the past task force members, past and current, how grateful we are for your leadership and for, the, and for the time and talent you've given to help solve this very real crisis in community. I also want to take this moment to thank Dr. Chen and former council member um, Derek uh, Young and then former council member Connor McCarthy. I wanna thank all of you for your leadership, for pushing us along the way and making sure that we were doing what our community really needed us to do. As you all continue to grapple with this issue, I would say as all of us continue to grapple with this issue, I hope that you'll dig in because so many people are, de are depending on us. Um, so many families, so many people who are addicted to opioids are depending on us to be able to get this work done, not just here locally, but to continue to advocate on both the state and national levels for responsible choices and opportunities to save members of our community. So thank you all for what you've done in the past. Thank you what you're doing today. And thank you for all the work that you will complete in the future. Have a great summit. And now I would like to introduce Elizabeth Allen, the Behavioral Health Policy Coordinator at the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. Good morning. As Sarah said, I'm Elizabeth Allen. I am the Behavioral Health Policy Coordinator for the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department, and I've helped lead the opioid task force efforts for the past five years. I can't believe it's been five years. Famous athlete Michael Jordan said, some people want it to happen, some people wish it would happen, and others make it happen. The Pierce County Task Force has definitely made it happen. Five years ago, community members, invested stakeholders, educators, faith leaders, law enforcement, politicians, just to name a few, came together to talk about the opioid crisis. Everyone agreed something needed to happen. Under the direction of Tacoma Mayor Victoria Woodard, who we just heard, former 
Tacoma Council Member Connor McCarthy, former Pierce County Council Member Derek Young, and Health Department Director Dr. Anthony Chen, the Pierce County Opioid Task Force became a team. As Mayor also mentioned, the task force had a unique opportunity five years ago to get a boost from the National League of Cities to help plan and organize what we know the task force today. The Opioid Task Force was the only group to receive this award west of the Mississippi. It was a great way to tip off the teamwork to coordinate and collaborate to decrease opioid misuse and to connect people to the right resources and work upstream with those prevention efforts. The task force has always taken a holistic approach to this work. We know that substance misuse affects families, loved ones, and those who need direct services. Now we lead community efforts, work monthly to deliver subcommittee initiatives, and provide funding for projects like naloxone distribution and fentanyl awareness. We should consider ourselves, everyone here today, champions of this work. We also want to acknowledge the contributions of some of the past all-star players here with us today. Former Pierce County Council Member and former Chair Derek Young, and Tacoma Pierce County Health Department's director, Dr. Anthony Chen. Derek Young knew the outlook for those with substance misuse was grim. He knew we all needed to act to support those who misuse, those who face with a loss of a loved one due to an overdose, and youth who struggle with mental health challenges. Dr. Chen, with public health experience and commitment to upstream prevention efforts, knew our communities. Pierce County needed to move from tertiary prevention to primary prevention. He knew this was gonna take a lot of time, effort, and support. Dr. Chen's de dedication to these efforts have transformed the Opioid Task Force from early days to now, five years stronger. We wanna thank both today, Dr. Chen and Derek Young, for working tirelessly on these efforts and initiatives and never giving up. At this time, I would like to invite Pierce County Council Member and our Opioid Executive Sponsor, Council Member Janie Hitchin, as well as Dr. Anthony Chen. So I get the honor of presenting the award to Derek. Um, you know, Derek, I, I really don't need talking points for Derek. I think many of you know him. Some of you may follow him on Twitter. I mean, he tweets about everything from the Sounders to uh, whatever. Um, uh, for elected officials, um, you may know him for, from the Puget Sound Regional Council, his strong advocacy for Pierce County. Um, those of you who live on the uh, Key Peninsula may know him from his days as city council member in Gig Harbor, um, or resolving, you know, these plaguing issues like Lake Bay Marina, right? There, how many times have we talked about that? And, you know, he also was very active on the national level. and. This task force would not be here today if um, Derek had not really pushed on this issue. Um, I remember in the early days, I know Connie Landberg was involved and Connor McCarthy was very critical in this, but without Derek pushing us and saying, this is what we need to do. This is what's going on on the national level. This is, we've got to pull things together. And between Derek and Connor, you know, scrounging, finding the, the pennies under the couch, getting, um, some funding for us to put together the summits every year, um, finding money for staffing uh, and different programs. Um, all I can say is thank you, Derek, and um, all the people in Pierce County um, really benefit from what you do, so. Yeah. 
since I'm now a former council member, I think the leash is a little shorter on time, so I'll be very brief. Uh, but I did want to say thank you all for being here and for those that are watching online. Uh, I really appreciate your attention to this. Uh, and for Council Member Hitchin and my former colleagues and folks uh, from around the community who are keeping this going, uh, it's really important to me. Uh, you didn't have to give me one of these to get me to show up here. I'll be back uh, in the future as well. But I do want to say the emphasis today that I'm really excited about is we have the chance for action. Uh, when we started this, it was without funding um, and there wasn't really you know, any on the horizon. And now we have not only the behavioral health tax was passed, uh, we have these settlement dollars that are coming in. And just Tuesday, my former colleagues uh, followed the city of Tacoma in passing the housing tax, which can be used to help build residential treatment facilities, which is something I will be bugging them about here in the near future. So thank you all again. So I'm back and I have the honor of acknowledging the many, many years of Dr. Chen's work for Pierce County. If you didn't see the press release, he is retiring. I don't know if he'll successfully retire. I've, I know some people struggle with that. So, um, so Dr. Chen has been with Pierce County for over 14 years and as a director of Pierce County Health Department, Tacoma Pierce County Health Department and the executive sponsor of the Pierce County Opioid Task Force, he is passionate super passionate um, about our community and he promotes policy and environmental system change. So it's looking at the system, finding the cracks and figuring out how do we make things better. Dr. Chen has earned praise for his work as an effective community convener and his ability to build strong partnerships with local health systems, the healthcare community, education and many community organizations. Dr. Chen has advocated for health equity, bringing a personal commitment to the health department's mission to protect and improve the health of all people and places in Pierce County. While he's been here, he's developed expertise in community health planning and program development, quality and systems improvement, health systems transformation, and cross-cultural medicine and cultural competency in healthcare. Dr. Chen has served on the state and national public health committees, regional planning bodies, local, state, and congressional district committees on healthcare access and reform and nonprofit boards. He's busy. A Duke University Medical Gra School graduated, uh, graduate, he completed family medicine re residency at the University of Cincinnati and a faculty, develop faculty development fellowship at Duke University and a fellowship in minority health policy at Harvard. He received a master's in public health at the Harvard School of Public Health, and he taught at a medical centers and universities. We recognize, he's behind me, so we recognize Dr. Chen for all of his many achievements, and we are grateful his, for his service, his leadership, and his dedication to the opioid task force from the very start. Thank you, Dr. Chen. We are so thankful for the work and the foundation that you have set and the lives that you have saved in Pierce County. Thank you. Thank you, um, Council Member Hitchens um, and Vice Chair Hitchens. Um, and actually really, uh, thank you to all of you. I mean, really this work cannot be done alone. Um, you heard Council Member Hines talk about it really takes a village and we have to work on this together. Um, by the way, let's give a hand to my staff who helps get this and the other people who got the um, summit going. So let's give them a big hand. And thank you so much to all our partners who are here today. Um, I see Suzanne Pock is here. I was talking with Rose Wilhelm earlier. Paul is here. Um, really, we cannot do this work without everyone pitching in. Um, and I, it's just, um, I get to be the figurehead and um, everyone thinks I, I'm really smart and do great things, but really it's all the people that I work with um, who make this happen. And thank you for the recognition.
And now at your tables, there are supplies for cultivating, our, cultivating a community of care activity. We would like to explore what it takes to create a system and culture of care in our community. Working with the people at your table, or if you have a small table, feel free to join another. Have about a five minute discussion about what it looks like, what words come to mind, and then write down these words and ideas on your purple ribbons. We also have hearts available if there are any special names or dates to you that you'd like to include on those as well. And in about 15 minutes, we'll come back to an overview of the opioid response plan. All right, hopefully everyone enjoyed that activity. Thank you so much for participating. At this point, I would like to welcome Elizabeth Allen back to the stage to share the opioid response plan overview. Hi there, I'm back. Um, this time I'm gonna talk a little, just a little bit about our opioid response plan that we have for the Pierce County um, Task Force, as well as I wanna remind everybody that we also follow guidance from the Washington State opioid response plan as well. So hopefully the slide up here um, talks about our purpose. The purpose of the response plan is to provide guidance in developing a regional response to mitigate past harm and prevent future harm from opioids and other substances upon residents of Pierce County. The work is guided by data, best practices, and informed by those who have lived experience with opioids and other emerging substances. As you can see, the purpose of the plan up there on slide one. Slide two, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the goals here. The goals in pursuit of a coordinated and collaborative solution to the issues, the Opioid Task Force has identified the following goals that serve as the underpinning of our work to address opioids, stimulants, and overdoses. So you can see those five goals there. We've got prevention education, access to treatment, ensuring right services at the right time, medications for opioid use disorder, as well as transportation. So going on to slide three, the Pierce County Opioid Task Force will create an effective regional strategy to respond to the opioid epidemic. That's number one for us. And number two is to shift from tertiary prevention to wellness, including primary and secondary prevention. As you can see here on slide three, we've got those two objectives and it goes into a little bit more detail on what we mean by create a regional strategy to respond to the opioid epidemic and objective two, shifting from that tertiary prevention to that primary prevention. As a reminder, we have our opioid task force structure. You've heard a little bit about that this morning. So we've got our, our executive leadership team. That's comprised of regional leaders. The committee's goal for that, the, the, the group that comes together for that, is to provide oversight and direction that leads to an effective regional response strategies um, that serve for the opioid epidemic. Then we have our steering committee, and that is comprised of those staff leaders with subject matter expertise in implementing strategies across the local regions. The goal of this committee, the steering committee, is to provide leadership, coordination, and organization to the opioid task force and committees, and to update and directly communicate with that ex executive leadership team. And then finally, we have our specific committees, which you'll be hearing updates from in a little bit. Um, and those specific committees, again, work on goals and objectives that lead up towards this plan. So hopefully that gives you just a little bit of an overview today on the opioid regional response plan that we have for our task force. Thanks so much. And now I'd like to share some updates from the different committees that we have on the Opioid Task Force. 
I'll start with the Access to Treatment Committee, which I co-chair with Dr. Eddie Goldstein, who couldn't be here today. Uh, so to recap some of our 2022 accomplishments, uh, 2022, we started back in the summer of 2022 after the committee had had several months off, reanimating the work group under new leadership. We worked with the group to define what does access to quality treatment in Pierce County look like? And you can see on the slide, we did some word clouding to, to, to define what was most important to the group in coming up with that definition. The words that are the largest are what came up the most. We also had what we called our show and telehealth series. Uh, so presentations from four telehealth substance use treatment providers in the community so that folks could be aware of uh, this particularly uh, accessible service that was available, um, and then redefining our purpose and direction. In looking ahead as far as what we'd like to accomplish in 2023, we've started doing some treatment access mapping, so determining different levels of care, different responses to the opioid crisis, um, different effective treatments, and where we're lacking and what we can do to advocate for change, and learning more about where best practices are already in action and opportunities to replicate those. And the quote on the bottom is uh, from our co-chair, Eddie Goldstein. He said, uh, what comes to mind when he thinks about what we've been doing in the access to treatment group is engaging with a complex and changing landscape. Slowly, thoughtfully, stirring the group process in the pot of hope for tangible benefits. And if you know Dr. Goldstein, you know that's very much a him quote. Uh, so I thought that was nice and wanted to share that with you all today. Uh, next, I'd like to... Uh, welcome up our co-chairs for the Medication for Opioid Use Disorder Integration Committee, Julie Keller and Haley Smith. All right, hello everyone. So my name is Haley Smith. I am the Clinic Operations Manager for Eleanor Health and the co-chair for the MOUD Integration Subcommittee along with uh, Julia here. I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Julie Keller and I work as a collaborative care practice facilitator at Kaiser. All right, so in early 2022, uh, we developed a survey for various community stakeholders and committee members to complete um, a better understanding or engage um, with MOUD integration within our community agencies and to guide our work over the coming year. So we asked questions to various organizations um, regarding what services um, they offer, including MOUD services, and what barriers they have identified to actually engaging in MOUD services. So some of the um, responses that we got were um, regarding challenges in integrating MOUD into their care, which was stigma, um, lack of education on MOUD with both providers and individuals with substance use disorders, as well as a lack of funding for those services. Um, about 40% of respondents indicated that they are offering MOUD services, though, so the majority were not. Um, the survey results did lead us to developing our 2022 project, which was an anti-stigma panel discussion. So we were able to lead two panel discussions um, with nursing students at Clover Park Technical College and Pierce County Community College in the fall. And as part of this project, we uh, developed a set of panel questions, including questions to share how our panelists see or experience stigma in their daily lives and how to reduce stigma surrounding SUD and providing education on SUD and MOUD. So we built connections with educators, and um, the educators were of the incoming healthcare professionals, so nursing students. And our panel consisted of subject matter experts, so including providers and individuals with lived experiences. Several of our panelists are actually here today, so we really wanted to thank you all publicly for that. Um, and we received great feedback from the students who were participating in these panel discussions and the educators that we worked with. Okay, so in addition to our work um, to spread the anti-stigma message this past year, we also had an impactful guest speaker um, and facilitated discussion named Dr. Nathaniel Schlicker, who worked for our state senate in 2013 and is currently working as a leader in the medical field locally. 
And he came to speak with our group and really reinforced the importance of spreading the anti-stigma message um, to healthcare professional education programs. And he also highlighted the importance of understanding and empathy when treating patients who might be experiencing substance use disorder. So not only was this conversation impactful to our anti-stigma work at local schools like Clover Park and Pierce College, but also in thinking about our goals and ideas for our next project. So our next project is going to be to create standardized communications that express understanding and compassion for the experience of SUD, and in particular, OUD. And this year, um, with the newly established Anti-Stigma Committee led by Ali Torin. Um, we're going to partner with the Anti-Stigma Committee to pass the Anti-Stigma uh, panel torch um, to them. So as we transition between projects, we're also planning to begin focusing on recruitment of new members to our subcommittee. Um, we meet on the second Friday of the month, and it's usually at 9.30 a.m. Um, we're looking for anyone with interest who might be um, working in the field or maybe those of us who have, have lived experience of SUD. If you're creative or if you have a background in communications and you're looking or thinking about how you might impact the community in this next year, um, come join our group and you can connect with Chelsea or with Cheyenne or with us um, and we'd hope to see you at our meetings. And next, I'd like to invite up Charnay Ducrest, the chair for the Transportation Committee. Hello, can you guys see me okay? I'm kind of short. <laughs> so my name is Charnay Ducrest. I am a health promotion coordinator in the methadone clinic at the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. And I talk really fast, sorry. Um, I have been a member of the Opioid Task Force since it started, and a couple years ago, um, we, like most of you probably know, um, identified that transportation is a big problem when it comes to accessing behavioral health services. Um, I work, I have lived experience myself. I work with people who are trying to access services but have trouble getting there, and it's barriers that are really difficult um, to, to get over by themselves. Um, We've been working, let me stop. Okay, so um, when we started, one of the things that we identified was that people experiencing homelessness have a really hard time accessing services, accessing transportation. It's really hard to call and have someone come pick you up if you don't have an address for them to come pick you up at, or if you don't have a phone to call to be able to request rides or a bus pass. And so we started this committee with an, kind of an assessment of the overall transportation in Tacoma, like what different medical services, transport services were available, what kind of bus services, what kind of funding. And from there, we've kind of um, developed a couple um, programs that uh, came out of this this discussion that we've been able to have. And so one of the things we did a couple years ago was help get the medical van started, and that takes uh, people experiencing homelessness around Tacoma to different social and medical services so that they can access those. And it's, you can call and they come around and they pick you up, and that's five days a week. So that was something that we were able to do a couple years ago, and we kind of provide continuing support. Um, this last year, though, we started doing Narcan distribution events at the different transfer stations for Pierce County, or Pierce Transit. So um, our first one we held at the 72nd and Portland Transfer Station, and um, the second one was last fall. And we held that at the Tacoma Dome Transfer Station. And one of the things that came out, well, a couple things came out of that. We kind of came out with some new um, focus ideas for what we're gonna do for our, for our committee. So a couple things, rural transportation. Like that is not a new um, challenge, but it's something that we might like to try and direct our efforts towards to see if there are some systems changes that we could advocate for or identify. Um, another thing is assisting Pierce Transit with their um, education and learning how to, how to compassionately address 
people who are suffering from some sort of substance use behavioral health disorder and they're on the bus and having trouble um, or for safety officers. And then the other thing we're kind of talking about is connecting agents, and this came out of our Narcan distribution events, is connecting agencies with like a, a my words are just not coming to me, um, a sustainable funding for Narcan. Um, schools are kind of having trouble with that. And there's different agencies in the community that don't have sustainable Narcan funding. And while it's available at places, like you can come down to the Pierce County Health Department and grab some, but we, we want to help places be able to have that avail readily available because we know it saves people's lives. So um, something else is we need a co-chair. I have been lonesome for a long time um, being the chair, and we would really love to have someone with some like fresh new ideas about transportation, or if you are someone with lived experience who has had uh, difficulties with transportation and you have some ideas, we would love to have you. So we meet the first Friday of the month from 12.30 to 1.30, and if you want to join our little group, go ahead and get in touch with me or Cheyenne or Chelsea, um, and we would love to have you. So I think that's everything. And now Suzanne Pop from the Prevention and Education Committee. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Suzanne Pack, and I'm the Director of Community Health for Answers Counseling. And um, like Shawna said, I'm, you know, I am the only co-chair. We would love to have another co-chair, and we're also recruiting um, members. So we, I would love to have you join us, and you can reach out to Cheyenne. Um, we meet every third Monday, and it's virtually, so hopefully it will work with your schedule. Um, you know, before I give the updates on our committee, I wanted to just first also um, give a shout out to Dr. Anthony Chen because he also, in addition to really championing the opioid task force, has um, championed the potentially preventable hospitalization initiative, which um, we're so thankful for because the 47th and the 49th legislative district, which is both in Pierce County, have some of the highest preventable hospitalization rates in the entire state. And as a result of that, we've been very fortunate to get support from the legislators to be able to work with the healthcare organizations like MultiCare and Virginia Mason Franciscan Health and Community Healthcare to be able to um, make sure that there is additional support in the communities. Um, maybe some are in Tacoma, but also in areas like Lakewood and Parkland and increasingly spreading out diverse um, geographically to be able to provide care where you are at in the community. And as part of that potentially preventable hospitalization initiative, we also provide monthly potentially preventable hospitalization learning collaborations, and you're welcome to join us for that as well. And we provide training sessions around screening, brief intervention and referral to treatment, and motivational interviewing. And um, you've heard from Sarah and Dr. Chen about the primary and the tertiary prevention and with ESPER, you, we get the chance to do secondary prevention, which is to identify those who are at risk and to get them help earlier, you know, and not wait until they hit rock bottom, so to speak. Um, and that is connected to the work that we are doing with the Opioid Task Force and with the Prevention and Education Committee. With this committee, we focus on kind of four pillars. The first is around providing prevention, education, and resources for youth and families. The second is around opioid prevent, uh, overdose prevention. The second is around kind of providing more capacity building for both individuals like yourselves and organizations. And the fourth is aligning to the state opioid response strategy. And if you've got the invitation to come to this event, you've seen the link from Cheyenne that kind of just shows you what the healthcare authority is doing and thinking about to approach the state, uh, opioid issue at a state level. And in our committee, we've been aligning with these four pillars. First, with the youth prevention, um, I'm so happy that there are folks in this room from the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department, Courtney, I think, uh, is one of them, you know, Elizabeth is another, and Cheyenne is another, who are really um, promoting youth mental health first aid and teen mental health first aid. So if you've ever had a desire to be a facilitator or an instructor around youth mental health first aid, this is a little bit different from teen mental health first aid because 
as an instructor for youth mental health first aid, you would be training other adults who work with youth. With teen mental health first aid, you would be certified to actually provide mental health first aid trainings directly to the teens themselves, preferably in school settings. So both of these trainings are, we think are really important at not only helping them understand um, the substance use types of issues, but to also kind of get them treatment and help for the underlying mental health conditions, because we know that there is a really huge connection between mental health and substance use. And if you'd like to be an instructor, again, please reach out to Cheyenne um, and she'll be able to connect you with some resources. With overdose prevention, um, you've heard from Charnay that uh, there is a lot of work being done around the naloxone and Narcan, and we've actually in our committee had training around that as well. And in 2023, our goal is to really promote um, Narcan vending machines. So this is something that we're really excited about. Yes, let's give a good applause to the health department for making this happen. This is very exciting because this really makes it more accessible. Um, and naloxone can be a life-saving intervention um, if somebody is going through withdrawal or um, overdose. So this can be, the fact that it's gonna be more accessible is a really great thing. And then in terms of capacity building, we spent last year really learning about what different organizations like Tacoma Rescue Mission um, or the Puyallup Tribe, et cetera, are doing in the space of opioid and other substance use. And this year, our goal is gonna to be to work with schools and youth serving organizations to really encourage trauma-informed care and harm reduction strategies so that when we are providing services, it's not always done with um, kind of that care and the stick approach, but it's done with the understanding that those who are using may have experienced trauma in their youth or currently. And then finally, with the state opioid response alignment, um, we're very excited that Multicultural Child and Family Hope Center, um, which is a really great organization that has early learning center, family support center, et cetera, in Hilltop area of Tacoma, and it also, fiscally manages the Tacoma Recovery Center. Multicultural Child and Family Hope Center and Answers Counseling was able to get a small grant um, from the state um, as part of the state opioid response grant. And what that means is that um, there is there has been training. You see the little picture up there. Um, those are all the people who took the training for the state Strengthening Families Program. And so we're going to be implementing the Strengthening Families Program as part of our opioid response um, to help teens, young teens, and their parents come up with more protective communication and coping strategies um, to prevent opioid use. Uh, so um, I wanna thank everyone for being a part of this, and uh, we hope to hear from you, not, not just my committee, but all the committee chairs want to hear from you, and hope you guys will get involved. Thank you. And finally, Ali Torin from our Anti-Stigma Committee. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ali Torin. I'm a certified peer counselor, SUDPT, and one of the co-chairs for the Anti-Stigma Committee. Um, the Anti-Stigma Committee is one of the newest committees uh, in the Opioid Task Force. We formed officially a form this year um, with the goal of combating stigma surrounding substance use disorder and recovery. We had our first official monthly meeting in January and have been lucky to welcome many new committee members um, over the last few months. Um, we recently partnered with the MOUD Integration Committee uh, to eventually take ownership of the panel discussions providing anti-stigma education in the community and we're hoping to expand this effort to reach more audiences um, and help reduce stigma in many more settings. Um, another exciting project that we have in the works is our anti-stigma language guide. Um, once complete, we're hoping to provi provide this, this guide to organizations to support in the recognition and replacement of stigmatized language and creating even safe, safer spaces in healthcare and in our community. Um, so we're just in our beginning stages, so there are many more good things to come. Um, if you have any questions or want to become a member, please feel free to reach out to me or Cheyenne. Um, we would love to have you. Uh, we're also looking for another co-chair, so if you're interested in that, please reach out to me. Um, yeah. 
So thank you so much um, and have a great day. <laughs>
uh, integrated departments uh, in the community. We come together and we talk about how we can better support our people. Um, Oh, compassion with all different types of recovery because everyone's recovery looks different. So um, how do we have compassion towards what, where they're at? Uh, healthy staff, I really like that one. Um, Self-care, because um, we can't do this work if we're not having our own self-care and that time to decompress after heavy um, situations. And then celebrate all types of wins, um, not just for our people, but for ourselves. Um, and then number three, how do we promote a system of care after this event? Do all of the above. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, not only for being our first group to go, but for everything that you shared. I love that culture is prevention, and I'm going to hold that with me and bring that back to my organization after today. So thank you so much. One more round of applause for our first group. Who wants to go next? Uh, Benji Biddle from the health department. First, I just want to thank the folks with lived experience around opioid use disorder and substance use disorder who are here today. I've learned so much from you, and I'm so humbled by your experience and your bravery in stepping into this space and holding us accountable uh, to change things. So thank you. Um, We talked mainly in our group that medication alone is not the answer, right? Support services to transition off of suboxone, off of methadone. The life skills and therapy that um, we often think about in terms of clinical uh, supportive kinds of systems, but it's really peer-to-peer -peer support as well. And some of the most culturally grounded, culturally competent approaches um, include being in non-traditional settings, so looking at supporting those more deeply. Uh, Narcotics Anonymous is fantastic for a lot of folks, and I think in public health, we're sometimes uncomfortable thinking about the role of faith and uh, purpose in this work, but for a lot of people, that's an important uh, tool in their journey into recovery. Um, so we're also talking about things like mental health courts and how uh, the expansion of those kinds of programs can be really supportive. And there's definitely room to explore that here in Pierce County along with uh, supported housing or recovery houses. And at the end of the day, uh, just part of recognizing the humanity in ourselves and each other is to talk about trauma and get to the root causes of some of these problems uh, and having those conversations be a part of what therapists are talking about, what we talk about we're, when we're in supported relationship with each other, and just uh, owning our responsibility to talk about the hard stuff. Hi, my name is uh, Vincent Barr, and I'm, and I'm a member of the community I came from over in Fircrest today, and uh, this is really important to me, all, all this. I don't like the rate of young people that are dying right now. I've had experience with uh, uh, a brother dying before his 21st birthday in a car accident, and a, a five-year-old son dying before his sixth birthday of a methadone accidental overdose. Um, so uh, I do know community members that have passed away, and uh, the death of, of anyone, especially children, is, is one of the worst things. So um, I'm going to throw a bunch of questions out. Uh, as I look at this group, most of the health department people, I, I wonder, where are the educators? Where are the teachers? Where are the administrators of the schools? Where's law enforcement? Where's the first responders? Where's the medical providers? Where's the nurses? Where's the other citizens? Where are the churches? Uh, all these touch points that can make a difference are not here represented well at all. Um, we gotta do something about that. The other thing with our children in the education system, we need to have a full court press on education and awareness. 
We need to build self-worth, value, and integrity of the human spirit, hope, and empowerment. We look at, we get, get on social media today that the world is divided. It's divided on race, it's divided on ideologies, it's divided on politics. We're at the brink of war around the country. How does a 15-year-old person handle all that? And especially when they deal with personal things like their parents are split up or they have other kinds of abuses in the home. What's their hope? What, what can we do, all, all these smart people in the room, to improve that condition? And so I, I know I'm just a mouth right now voicing my concerns, but we're in a dire uh, position uh, as a society and, and uh, uh, of humankind. So thanks for giving it an effort. Um, but we need to laser focus in on some of these other things in terms of connection, involvement, and, and how to help our kids for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for everything that this table shared about breaking down the boundaries and being able to cross over into areas that aren't necessarily our expertise, but pull in the right people at the table to make a difference. Thank you so much. Hello. Um, to the questions today, our first one, the elements needed to create a system of care. Uh, we felt really strongly about the fact that we need to educate both our community and our providers on intergenerational trauma and trauma-informed care. We felt that that was very important to understand because many of the people in the community, both minority and otherwise, um, have suffered a lot of trauma and that has not been addressed and that's created many of the problems we're trying to then help them overcome. <clears throat> Um, and in addition to that, we have to help them meet you know, their basic needs. We have to help them with housing and wraparound services. Um, we need them to lead us in the direction of helping them acquire the things that they need and not just the things we believe they need by having a community-led survey. We also need to make sure that they are in the driver's seat of their own care. Um, Many of them have priorities other than those we would assume they have, and we need to make sure that we're giving them the appropriate level of care according to what they need from us. In our current practice, we create systems of care first by providing a low barrier program. We accept walk-ins, we take patients any time of the day. As long as we are open, we see them and we provide care. But we also um, provide all of the patients that come in with resources, uh, and we do so on an ongoing basis. Every client is assigned a support specialist who helps them anytime that they desire or request assistance, or anytime another employee identifies an area where they need assistance. Um, we are very active about encouraging them to communicate with us both their needs and desires so that we can be sure we're addressing them appropriately. And for promoting a system of care moving forward, I think first we need to do more education, not just among you know, the community, but also among the providers and facilities uh, and the patients themselves, so that they can be aware of what resources are available, so that they can be aware of what um, treatments are options for them. We need to make sure that the boards that lead these efforts um, within Pierce also involve all of the providers that are in the community, because many times we're not aware of the things that are being offered or how to access these or even how to direct our clients to these events. And if we're not being informed, then we can't properly take advantage of the things that are being offered. We also think that um, Housing is such a large, large issue in the community. We really feel like some of the funds that are being directed towards this effort also need to go towards housing needs because we can help them and give them medication assistant treatment all day, every day, but if we're not helping them to fix their situation or overcome those barriers that are in their way to having a better quality of life, we're not setting them up in the best chance for success.
Thank you so much for the work that you're doing and for bringing forth the importance of self-determination and care and the housing first perspective. Who would like to go next? All right, all the way across the room, getting my steps in. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, and thanks to the other groups for you know, the insights and nuances that you provided. We'll try to add ours to it. Um, so first, the, the elements in a system of care, our group talked about trauma-informed education community connection, cultural responsiveness, competency, and relevance, access to language, building more partners and community, resource sharing between sectors, access to services, as transportation, for example, more education at the agency level. Um, you know, there's learning at word of mouth, but also taking advantage and learning to map that networking, because those are already efficient communication systems, but do we know them? Have we tapped into them? Can we communicate through them deliberately, intentionally? Centralized county resource repository. Is there one place where we can find this information? Is it accessible to everybody? Is it readable, right? What can we do to create systems of care? Invoice the, the people that are doing the work, right? Um, sorry, involve the people that are doing the work. When they're on the front lines, we need to know how, what they're seeing and how we can better serve them. Realistic workloads for providers to provide comprehensive care, right? Their time is not billed, so we need to find, you know, support and advocate for them, to advocate for their understanding and their education. Um, increased outreach. Consent with patients and clients for how to best address their needs, individual responses, right? Resource booths at community events to organize and distribute the appropriate, to the appropriate entities a way to connect with each other before and after events. What did we learn? What can we share? How can we better serve together? Um, and incorporate debrief sessions, both before and after, networking before, debriefs after. You know, are we all on the email chain to keep the conversation going? And then finally, how do we promote systems of care um, after the event? We want to learn about the funds distribution. We're curious, like, what, what's happening in that plan? We want to go to where patients are, where members are, and mobile training teams was another, like, to, to find people where they need to know they can travel and teach them about Narcan, response, prevention, training, first aid, um, to get people where they are. So, thank you. Thank you, and I keep hearing the importance of breaking down silos come up. Yep. I was just going to interject. The last table that spoke was from Calvitz Tribal Health, and I think it would be helpful as people speak if they wouldn't mind identifying kind of the nature-ish of their table. I think it's helpful. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And from this table? So we had a mix of... Um, uh, we have labor and industries here. We have um, community health nurses, public health um, department uh, officials, or regional case managers for community health plan. And then we also have um, clinical providers. We had one, one clinical provider that left for substance use. Um, and I'm sorry. Um, dental. Ah, so dental as well. Wonderful. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> Thank you. I think we have time for one more group to report out. Okay, uh, we'll be right there. All right, my name is Sarah Conrad. Um, I guess I serve on the Violence Prevention Committee with Pierce County, um, allocating funds to our violence prevention programs. Um, we have two deputy, uh, deputy prosecutor from Bonnie Lake and prosecuting deputy prosecutor for, for Pierce County and answers counseling. All right, so our answers, what are the elements needed to create a system of care in our community? Um, access to resources and services, uh, prosecuting possession and allowing our drug court systems to be an option because they allow a lot of cool things like getting your license back, access to employment, and just the building blocks that are needed after you get the get clean. Um, geographical re restrictions that the, um, Tacoma and Seattle usually get the majority of all of the services in Bonnie Lake and Ording and all the rural areas sometimes are left out. And treating the root problem of trauma and not only medicating, but working side by side with medication and counseling to solve it. That's what we have. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Okay, we have time for one more group. Anyone else like to share? All right, so my name is Pamela Denny. I work for a nonprofit organization called Heidi's Promise. We are in the Sumner and Puyallup Bonnie Lake School Districts. So I do get to work with the kids. And I do think everybody's had some really great responses. And I think remembering that the kids in this community need safe spaces to be before and after school. So I know sometimes we tend to fixate on a problem and not look at what's happening outside. And so having coordinated care is incredibly important, but creating safe spaces for those children to gain skills, to gain confidence, to feel like a part of a community is incredibly important, especially when their homes are not safe spaces. So taking care of those kids is incredibly important. So I have another partner from Heidi's Promise here with me. We have Rainier Recovery and a council member, correct? At our table, thank you. Thank you so much to everyone who shared and for all the work that you all are doing um, to combat the opioid crisis in our community. We heard some really incredible perspectives and just feel so grateful to, to have you here and hear these perspectives today. Um, at this point, we'll be hearing from Council Member Hitchin to share with us an update on the opioid settlement funds. So um, first off, Sarah, I want to thank you very much for facilitating today. I want to make sure that happens. Um, we know that we have some opportunities in front of us. We've heard some really phenomenal ideas. And um, this afternoon, um, we're going to have a working lunch where we're going to have some time to really talk about how we can turn ideas into actions here in our county. Um, I want to acknowledge and first uh, thank my team that's been supporting me uh, to kind of organize the work that I'm doing today. So. In, in our department, we have Director Moss, who's here with us today. From the prosecuting attorney, we have Michelle Luna. And um, on our staff, uh, Lee Beth Merrick, and then my amazing assistant, who keeps me sane and showing up where I'm supposed to be. Um, so I want to make sure that I do that, because I don't want to forget. So um, this is our agenda for the day, uh, for this chunk of time that we're going to spend together, um, going over a few things. Essentially, there's a lot of interest. I know that I've had community members ask me questions. I've had electeds ask me questions. They just really want to understand because we've seen the articles in the newspaper. We've seen stories. There was a lawsuit. Money's coming to every state, every region. And it sounds like a huge amount of money, but this is a huge problem in our community. So we need to really be thoughtful and, and really think about how we can do these things together. Um, so we're going to go over the fundraising settlement, so exactly how we got here, what's coming to our community. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what are the approved funds, and I have a handout for you to take back um, and to use while you're in your um, conversations today so you can actually see the what's approved and what's not. And to be honest, it's a very long document. There's not a lot that's not on there. Like, it's a long document. There's a lot of approved uses. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, Opioid Abatement Council, the OAC, which is necessary to actually do any of the work that we want to do. And we're going to talk about how the government is involved in this process. And then we're going to pause and break out and have those conversations. And the reason we divided the room, in case you missed, you were on side one or side two, was because we have different conversations. So we're gonna have a conversation around what you wanna do, what are our priorities as far as funding, and we're gonna have some policymakers and staff who are gonna be working on how do we actually do all the legal stuff to make this happen. And those are two really important conversations that need to happen before we can start the work. So we're gonna go ahead and make sure that happens. And I will pause for questions somewhere in there. So if we can go to the next slide. I am absolutely aware that you probably cannot read these numbers, so don't worry. 
Um, so uh, this lawsuit happened across the country. It's not just a Washington State thing. Um, but Attorney Bob Ferguson, uh, Attorney General Bob Ferguson, um, took on for our state doing this lawsuit for Washington. Uh, and what has happened is that this lawsuit was based on three key things and then population. So the things that they looked at as far as how they came to these numbers, it wasn't some, nobody threw darts. It was, there was like a purpose and reason. It was based on the actual number of opioids shipped to your community, so they counted them up, um, the number of deaths due to opioid poisonings and misuse, and then the number of people suffering from opioid disorders. So they took that and used those, da those data points to come up with the, what they were asking for in this settlement. And so Pierce County and Washington State um, are part of the settlement. So Washington will be receiving $952 million. Again, sounds like a really big number. 50% of that will go to the state. And so that's not part of the conversation we will have today. We're talking about what we can do in our county. And then the other half went to local governments. And remembering our local governments are our counties, cities with a population over 10,000, and then our tribal governments also receive direct funding. We had to sign on to what was lovingly called the One Washington MOU, base, basically saying we're going to follow these rules together to get access to these funds. And we do have, um, to any of my local governments in the community, we have one more settlement that requires you signing on by April 18th. So if you don't know what I'm talking to, please talk to Michelle Luna, uh, and she can make sure that your community is doing that. We are going to receive approximately $48.5 million over 17 years, so it's coming out every year to every government that is receiving funds, and the, the amounts vary because these are different lawsuits, and of course they all had different rules, um, and so each lawsuit is coming in at different timing, but they will all go through the same process. They come to the government, and the rules are the same as far as um, the general what we are allowed to spend things on. And can we go to the next slide? Perfect. So approved uses. There's a lot of things we can do um, when we talk about treatment. The biggest thing that um, the biggest thing is we need to find the things in Pierce County that are really going to be impactful around treatment, and then what are the things that are going to help short-term, like right away, but also long-term. So some of the things that show up in this document, again, I have copies because it's many, many pages, um, and I say it's in somewhat legalese, but pulled some things for you. Um, but as far as treatment, we've got things as high level as residential treatment centers, and then down to things like telehealth, having treatment go out into the communities. It could look at medically assisted treatment. It could look at programs that are um, peer support or peer group trainings. We can look at um, how do we very intentionally deal with people and help people who are dual diagnosed. So all of those things and many, many pages more are things that we can do under treatment. Under prevention, it could be looking at how are we tracking prescription drugs that are coming into the county and what do we do with those? Um, and then providing opportunities for drug take back, which we already do, but are we doing it in a way that actually is helpful as far as the education portion? Is it easy for people to do so that they can get the opioids out of their house if they have them in their home so they're not accessible to someone who's not prescribed them or a child? Do we have um, Narcan and Nar Naloxone out in the community when they need it? And do we have training on how to administer it? And do we have things to produce, uh, reduce stigma so people will actually access help? So all of those things fall under prevention because the goal is to reduce the number of deaths, reduce the number of people misusing, and help those that are to reduce the harm they're doing. Under other strategies, and other strategies is kind of a all of the above type category. Uh, that's where we get into things like using our courts, first responders, training in schools, um, expanding access, how do we connect services with 988 and 
actually getting people to services. There's a variety of different things. I like to think this is the training. How do we train people? And how do we actually encourage people to ask for help? How do we get people to say, I, I have a problem, or I have a concern, or I have a mother or father or child that needs help? I need them to do something. But right now, people don't know who to ask. We, we haven't provided the connection. And I think that's one of the things we want to work on. The last part is called the um, administrative costs because programs cost dollars and we also have to track this funding. So there, in the agreement, there are two levels of funding that can come out. The first is 10% for the governments to put the dollars out the doors or administrative costs. And the other is up to 10% to actually run what is lovingly called the OAC. Both, that's the cap, so if somebody's spending 25% total on all the administration, they're not following the rules. So, and we have to report through the OAC to the state and the Attorney General, so they'll be tracking that kind of thing. Can we go to the next slide? I like that, I can see it. A lot of words on this slide. Um, the biggest thing to keep in mind is um, the OAC is an oversight board. It is making sure that the funding is being used the way it was designed for during the settlement process. Uh, so the one regional, it is our one and only regional oversight body. It represents all of Pierce County. So you don't have to have an OAC in each city. You just have to have an OAC for the, for the region, which for us is Pierce County. Uh, it has to be established prior to us spending any dollars, so there is a sense of urgency at the government level because we have some fantastic ideas. You can't spend any money until we kind of figure out what this looks like. The members of the OAC must represent the participating governments and have work or ex educational experience in one of the approved uses, and like I said, there's hundreds of uses. And by um, experience, it doesn't, they don't have to be a clinician, they don't have to be a substance use disorder because they are the reporting agency. They aren't going to be telling us what to spend dollars on. They're going to get the reports of what we did and then they're going to make sure that all is right with the world and then they provide data. So it is not an allocation committee. Um, participating governments determine the member selection, so we're going to decide who's going to be the representatives of the OAC, and that'll be done through some kind of interlocal agreement or um, some sort of contract, again, all to be determined by your local governments. And the OAC can technically be a funding allocation if any of our cities decide to forego, I mean, give up their funding. Um, if any city wants to do that, I'd like to have a conversation. There's an easier way to do that because we can, we can do this in a different way. And I'll go into that in the next slide. And then the last part is the thing I already mentioned, that 10% of this has to go to pay support this work. They have to provide data. They have to provide resources. They have to actually be like a phone call away to the member jurisdictions of this to make sure that this work is being done appropriately. So they're key to the work, they're key before we start, um, but we get to kind of talk through what that looks like. Can we go to the next slide? So the last one that I wanna go over, and I know I'm between you and lunch, um, are the options. And the options for each jurisdiction um, that we have before us, so this is how we can spend the money. Um, so the options are, a, a community could choose to forego, give up their funds. Um, I, again, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna say, please don't, let's talk. Um, the second one is spend directly. So this would be a government saying, hey, we're gonna put out an RFP for X. They can decide what kinds of things they want. They are supposed to work with the community to come up with things that you think your community needs in that RFP process. Um, and then put that out, and then they will report to the OAC what, what they've spent dollars on. The third option is pooling funds, and that would be some sort of contractual agreement about we're gonna pool, some, pool our dollars in total and we're gonna work together. Some of our communities are getting really small amounts of dollars every year, a couple thousand dollars for a city to deal with the opioid epidemic for that entire city is not a lot of money. And so when we pool dollars, I think we can get a lot further together. 
The last way is to pool some funds and spend some funds directly. And I think most of our larger cities, um, and I know that the county is very interested in doing that because we think that's how we get further together. And uh, it really is just how do we actually make this happen together? So at that point, I'm gonna pause for questions. Sarah, what's the best way if somebody has a question? Okay, so I saw her hand go up first in the back corner, like you're getting your steps in. You already said that. I am from the administrative service organization for the county, um, Carolina Behavioral Health. And I was just wondering if you guys have determined who will be administering the funds, because I know in other regions, the administrative service organization is administering the funds. Fantastic question. The answer is no, we haven't determined that yet. Um, when we divide up today, we're going to be having conversations. But if people have ideas, please feel free to use, contact my office, and I can make sure it gets to the right people. We are interested. If you would like that. I can give you my card. Okay, thank you. Um, I just had some concerns with a couple of things that I'm with the health department and community engagement. Um, in the news that I just have heard that, you know, Trank in some states is in all of the fentanyl on the streets and that Narc, what is it, Narcon? Yeah, Narcan, um, does not work you know, for somebody that has that kind of an overdose. And so I hear, you know, funds being aimed at making these vending machines and all of that. And I'm just wondering how long it's going to be before and what percent is it at, at now where, where that's the situation here where that's maybe those are going to be a little bit obsolete, like they're not really going to help with the, with the problem. And also the fact, how close are we to having a fentanyl? Because I have also heard that in the emergency rooms, they don't t test for fentanyl because like they can't, they don't have a test. So those are two questions that I have. So to the emergency room testing for fentanyl, I'm not sure, but I know that we can use funds to buy Narcan and have it out. We can buy, we can buy test strips so people can actually do the testing, whether it's at home or whatnot. If that was a decision that was made um, by local governments to do that, it'd be an interesting conversation to see the need. The other part is this is over 17 years. When a local government decides we're going to spend X number of dollars, it's going on a, on a thing. We do this again and again. So as sadly the drug changes, we will be able to move and change how we're prioritizing what we're spending money on. So what we decide today may be irrelevant in five years. Maybe we have, I'm gonna live in a perfect world, we've solved the issue with youth and somehow solved that completely. Now how do we tackle young adults or seniors or some other population, right? So we get to change over time. It's, it's, it's ongoing funding for 17 years, and I truly have no idea why it's 17 years, but somebody set it up that way. And if I didn't quite answer your question, grab me afterwards. Yeah, it's a big question. Okay. Hi, I'm Sarah for Calatinian Tribe. So on these Narcan vending machines, how many Narcans are gonna be given to people using these machines? Because from my understanding, um, when we're giving out Narcans, We've been advised to give out two to three boxes um, to our clients to reverse an overdose on fentanyl. So I don't have the answer on the Narcan vending machines. Is there someone in the room that could connect with her? Okay, thank you. You have the answer? Do you want to? Paul, can I have you wait till you get the mic? Because I know people at home might also want to know the answer. Thank you. So I'm Paul Wachowski. I'm the director of the syringe exchange, and we deployed the Narcan vending machines. There are three machines, one at First United Methodist Church in Tacoma on 6th and Tacoma. There's one at Moore Library at 56th and Pacific, and there's one at the Recovery Cafe Ording Valley. Each machine holds 90 boxes of Narcan, which is 180 doses. And so let's, let's be clear, Narcan works to reverse an opioid overdose, all right? Now, if there are other drugs mixed with the drugs they've taken, it may not work against those. But any opioid, Narcan will work on. Now, depending upon the quantity of the opioid in the person's system, which is very difficult when you're buying street drugs, you have no idea how strong the drugs are. So with fentanyl, it's very tricky. So you might need 
two doses, you might need three doses, you might need five or six doses. Most people will revive after one or two doses, which is one box. Some people might need more because we don't know what the potency of street drugs is. But any opioid can be reversed with Narcan. Now, there are drugs that mimic opioids that are not reversible by Narcan, so someone might think they're having an opioid overdose, but they're not. So let's be clear, Narcan only works on opioids, it works on all opioids. And so when someone is having a drug overdose or a drug poisoning, you, re you really need to know what drug they're taking. And the problem with a lot of folks today is they're taking drugs that they think are non-opioids, but they're contaminated with opioids. That's why even if you're a meth user or someone taking uh, other types of drugs, you need to have Narcan available because you don't know what's in the drugs. Yeah, make sure you do rescue breathing, make sure you call 911 and give a dose, wait two minutes, give another dose. If they don't revive, give a third dose, but make sure you call 911. Thanks. Thank oh, you, Paul. More than 200 boxes of Narcan have gone out from the machines. So about 230 boxes have gone out so far. We've put, in, we've put 500 boxes into the machines and they hold 90 each. Okay, so lunches are here, um, and so I just kind of want to explain, anyone who doesn't know me, I was a former teacher, so we're, we're in good hands, I have a plan, we're gonna make this work. Um, so the idea is that we want to have these conversations about um, what is happening, um, oh, did I miss a slide? No, can we go to the next slide? There we go, yeah. Um, so we're gonna divide into two groups. You already are, essentially, and you are gonna have a working lunch, understanding that I wanna give you time to like kind of reset, kind of figure out what you're doing, open the boxes and that kind of stuff. Um, but the conversation that's gonna happen on each side of the room is slightly different. So the opioid task force members, um, including some of the fabulous um, health department team and Sarah's team and some of our advocates and providers that are here, like Paul, who answered that great question, we're gonna have a conversation about what are your priorities? If you could talk to your government leaders who are gonna be organizing and kind of figuring out how the money goes out the door, what do you wanna tell us to spend on first? What are your priorities? Understanding that it takes some time, government speed, we wanna be ready with answers as soon as we determine how the money goes out the door, what do we want to spend on first? So you're prioritizing to make sure that we have the best information as policymakers. So that's, that's what's happening on this side of the room. And then on this side of the room, we're going to be having, and we're actually going to move tables to make sure we can really, like, because we're a smaller group, um, get together. We're going to be talking about the formation of the OAC because we can't spend any money until we have an OAC. So there's some real need to make that happen. Um, and talk about the process of how that'll happen and some of the oversight that needs to happen. And, and I know that my goal as doing this work for Pierce County, with Pierce County, is to come up with a plan that gets as much of the funding out to the services. And so how do we make this as streamlined and effective as possible with as little overhead as possible so that we are paying for things and paying for people to do the work to save the lives in our community. That's the goal of these dollars, and that's how we should settle, like, be thinking about it. So this side of the room will be doing that, and this side will be doing the, what do we want to spend money on? Are we good? Uh, yeah. and We'll be stopping the live streaming for the remainder of the summit. So we just really want to thank everyone who live streamed this year from home. Thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of this important work. We appreciate you. Thank you so much, everyone, for these discussions. I know we probably didn't have time to get to everything. Um, this is hopefully just the beginning. Um, we have five minutes left, so I would like to ask Council Member Hines, Council Member Hitchin, and Dr. Chen to come back up to the stage for closing remarks. So thank you all for being here today. Really appreciate the time. Um, <clears throat> it's been wonderful conversations and really great to see all the people that are doing this work. Again, as I said um, at the beginning with my remarks, coming back to right place, right time, right treatment 
focusing on how we best serve the people in our community, where they are, when they need it, with what they need. Um, and I look forward to working with all of you in the future on those three things. Thank you. Um, I just uh, want to thank everyone that pulled this together, um, especially Chelsea Amato, who's not with us today, um, was phenomenal getting us here today, and to um, Sarah for jumping in and filling her show shoes to be our uh, MC, and then the team uh, that uh, put this together, boots on the ground. We were meeting on Zoom for the last couple of months to kind of be here, uh, present in the work to, to support us all. Um, thank you for your time this afternoon and thank you so, so much. Thank you. Yeah, let me um, add my thanks to all of you for being here today. I think we've had a lot of good discussions, a um, lot of good questions as well being raised. Uh, you've heard about what the task force has done in the past. Um, I hope that you will be thinking about what the task force will be doing in the future. Uh, one of the things I, uh, we heard loud and clear on our half of the room uh, was that we need more voice um, of the community here with us. So um, that's, um, let's commit to do that. Um, but above all, um, you know, let's all commit to make a difference, to make, uh, get the work done. There, there, we've come through a lot of um, struggles and uh, overcome a lot of barriers, but our communities deserve action, and we need a comprehensive and coordinated system to address that. Um, so thank you again for being here. Thank you for all the work you have done in the past, and thank you for the work you will be doing in the future. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. We've really enjoyed exploring our theme of creating a system and culture of care in our community with you. We appreciate the hard work every one of you does within our community. And before I say anything further, I just want to say a huge thank you to Cheyenne Keenan for coordinating this whole thing. Big round of applause. Uh, please do feel free to reach out to Cheyenne also if you have any questions about the opioid task force or are interested in joining or uh, leading in any of the committees that were mentioned. We're always looking for new members to share new ideas and keep the work going. We'll be sending out a survey in the next few weeks with a recording of the summit, so please do participate in that to share your ideas so that we can continue the work and improve the work. Um, there is extra food, pastries, coffee. Please feel free to grab that on the way out. Cheyenne's card is also on the front table. Thank you so much to everyone who made this summit possible.